The Beginner's Guide is a video game. Well, it's not quite right. The Beginner's Guide is a walking simulator. Oh, that's too aggressive. The Beginner's Guide is a skill check of pretentiousness, a great realization of an internet-wide failure to understand art. Before properly writing my direct thoughts on the game, despite knowing that no one has said what I think the game is about, what my own personal perspective is, and the takeaway I got from it, I always take the time to watch every video essay about it. I do this with everything I talk about. Why should I talk about the thing if my takeaway is just the general consensus, or if it's something else someone has already said? It's not worth your time or my time rehashing something we all already know or feel about the thing. And the irony starts to set in. Let's say you sit down at a stranger's computer. You start opening up files and looking through stuff, and eventually you come to a folder that just says, My Work. So you open it, and you click on a random file, and it's a video game that looks like this. If you had to guess, what would you say you know about this person right now? Like, maybe they're kinda goofy. Okay, you close that, you scroll down a bit, and you open up a new file. It's another game. Do you think this person is happy? Are they unhappy? Now another one. What do you think is comfortable for this person? What puts them at ease? Do you think they're lonely? What's missing in their life? Keep going, open another file. Let's look at all of them. Let's unpack this person. Are they upset about something or fighting something? What do you think makes this person angry? What kinds of friends do they have? Do they even enjoy making video games at all? Take all of these images, hold them in your mind, and now try to imagine, without ever having met this person, who they are. Okay, let's do it. Let's find out if you're right. Before we even start the game, the art recognizes something. My intent here is not to debunk or expose these other videos for falling into this trap as they do, but I do want to highlight a few moments from these videos. The beginner's guide to me is all about one simple, powerful metaphor. In my interpretation of this metaphor, we have Davy Reedon playing the role of a person like me. Someone who lives off the thrill of explaining other people's art, even if it was never meant to be explained in such detail. He narrates us through his thoughts on the work of a fictional game creator named Coda, from his first Counter-Strike map to his very last game. This game very much plays out like a Leadhead video. If I were to make a video on all of Coda's games, it would look and sound a lot like the Beginner's Guide. We start out with this hopeful, nostalgic look at the abstractations in Coda's first Counter-Strike map. Davey remarks on how these nonsensical floating crates break the illusion that this is a real place, but that they also give it a personal touch, reminding you that the map was made by a person. A simple analysis of a simple level, but in this analysis he gives us, there's one line that makes my skin crawl after having already seen where this game was going a year ago. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Davey says that he wants to go beyond the game and use the game to learn about its creator. This is where an analysis like mine becomes actively malicious. Unfortunately, however, it's a line that I have to dance on just about every time I make a video on a specific game. No matter how many times I try to bring across the point that this is just my interpretation, even if you completely disagree with my video, the next time you play Bioshock, you're going to see a little bit of my analysis in it. And it's inevitably going to warp your perception of the game, at least a little bit. And if you're really swayed by that video, then Bioshock becomes a game that's coming from my perspective as much as it is its creators. In the wake of the unexpected success of The Stanley Parable, Davey Prime released a rather eloquent blog about depression and self-doubt, sentiments very directly echoed in Davey the narrator's dialogue. So in that time, did Davey Prime develop an unhealthy relationship with another game designer whose creativity he was envious of? Did he betray their trust? And did he funnel that experience into his next game? And if so, who were they? But at the end of the day, the only thing really at stake in that line of inquiry is 
what kind of asshole is or isn't Davy Prime. The other prevailing theory is that Coda is just Davy Prime talking to his younger self. And these debates about authenticity tend to cloud any discussion of if we simply accept that the game is a fiction and move on from there, what the game has to say. And that may be because what the beginner's guide is trying to say is really fucking slippery. Because the game is just so meta, it's super meta! Which made me wonder whenever I tried to engage with it just how meta my engagement should be. For example, Davy the narrator clearly suffers from imposter syndrome. The game is from his perspective, so my reflex is to identify with that anxiety. But by the end of the game, it's not only clear that he's done something really shitty, but that he's a fictional character. So my next question is, does Davy Prime want me to question the fact that I reflexively identify with a shitty person, provided they have a pain I recognize and they control my point of view? And then, or does Davy Prime want me to question the fact that I asked myself that question and then projected that intention onto him. And then, or does Davy Prime want me to question the fact that I asked myself that question and then projected that intention onto him? And on and on like this. We knew Davy the narrator's intentions, but we don't know Davy Prime's. Anything the game might be saying might also be a meditation on the fact that you think the game is saying that. Laura Mondanis read the game as a feminist look at how creepy dudes violate boundaries. Liz Ryerson read it as Davy Prime attempting and ultimately failing to engage with his own privilege. And Robert Yang pondered what might drive a person to make a game as a message to another person, and wondered if he himself is Coda. First rule of the beginner's guide is that you do not talk about the beginner's guide. It's a game that doesn't want to be written about, according to Laura Hudson's article. Or, as game designer Liz England puts it, it resists interpretation. By digging for meaning, we're perilously close to committing its cardinal sin. It instills an uncomfortable subconsciousness in anyone who attempts to look at it for too long, making any inquiring audience uniquely aware of where they're positioning themselves. These are just a small selection of videos on the subject. I know I did something I don't usually do, which is have a lot of text on screen, but I don't want to interrupt them or really do any kind of reaction to their videos but I did want to explain why I don't like these videos and why I'm highlighting them and how they fall short with the narrative of the game. Most of them seem to recognize that the narrative is making even a passing critique of the act of what they are doing, but they don't consider how doing that act without changing it is ironic. I'm not conceited enough to think that I can go beyond their efforts and critique and analyze this game in some way that has never been done before. That's never been the point of anything I've done, and I would never want to. Besides, art is a form of expression. When I draw something or write this script, edit this video, and also when I make my own video games, I'm trying to express an idea. The Beginner's Guide's introduction through this trailer and the efforts of video essays like this expose a dark reality of analysis and critique. And even though this seems poised directly at video essayists, almost as a critical takedown of them, I don't believe the gun is actually aimed at them. I believe that some sort of self-important grandeur makes them feel as though they're being targeted in this situation, because it contains the aesthetics of the thing that they do, the aesthetics of criticism, that it must be a breakdown of what they do. But I think there's a completely different answer here, and even though I am also a video essayist, I think that it's one that the typical video essayist could never hope to understand. If it isn't obvious already, this video does spoil aspects of the beginner's guides as it always planned to do so. In my opinion, the beginner's guide is something that you must experience firsthand. Watching a walkthrough or anything else doesn't quite give you the same experience. There's a lot that's shown and not said despite the fact that there is a narrator telling you everything. This is because as the narrative reveals to you, as you should know by this point, the narrator is separate from the person who made these quote unquote games. And they have edited them in order to both tell you this story of this person as well impose their own meaning onto the work. 
If you don't know me, and likely you don't, the title of this segment is a joke. There are two words that I found issue with when talking about media analysis and criticism. This is playing off the pretentious video essayist concept and obviously poking fun at it. But perhaps your first interaction with this is seeing this as a chapter title in the description and thinking, oh, this guy must love smelling his own farts. Maybe it was a matter of you knowing that I've talked about how much I hate this phrasing and telling someone else that I'm being a hypocrite for using them like this without actually knowing this context and the fact that I'm making light of their interpretation. This isn't me just waffling about some way I could be misrepresented, rather this is a setup. This example here is ascribing you, the audience, authority. Here I am exercising a method of trying to understand how I could be understood, or rather in this instance, be misunderstood, and recognizing how absent of context that understanding that I am reaching for becomes difficult or borderline impossible. How does this recognition apply to this game? Well, to give an example, we can look at one example in the game itself, the space station. Here we are told to close our eyes and not open them until the end. The game literally cannot be completed in this fashion. Well, at least as far as understanding what is happening. And even the narrator points this out. You should probably open your eyes if you haven't already. It's pretty much impossible to solve otherwise. And there is a solution, by the way. Knowing this, here, Coda knows that you're going to look and see what's happening even though they had asked for you to be blind. In doing so, you're now able to read the text of other crew members on this space station. If Coda didn't want you to be able to be unblinded like this, then they would have literally left the screen black the entire time. Whether it's Davy's meddling or otherwise that allows us to see doesn't particularly matter. Here we are going to attempt to understand what Coda was saying with this piece of art. We're going to isolate it from its context that Davy gave us, and we're going to isolate it from the context of what edits we know Davy makes. This becomes important to understand why Davy edited it in the way he did. So, we're back. We can now see, unfortunately against the instructions of Coda, and that all of the crew members on the space station are impaired in some way. This sort of creates an interesting narrative in itself. That here you are assigned to be blind as others are equally assigned with blindness. And what they say builds a narrative. Something happened that caused it, and the one thing here that isn't actually blind is the truth. The truth can see. And conveniently, where does Davy place his street lamp? The truth. The truth only accepting one answer. The one answer that above all else, Davy wants. So, what's being said here? If we acknowledge Davy's narrative as being true and looking at this story and then as other games existed as abstract narratives towards Davy, then this almost seems to illustrate a situation where Davy, as the egotistical savior, knows the only truth amongst the blind, even the captain and the other experienced staff. But, like I said, we need to understand this without Davy, at all, absent of his involvement. If this were a singular expression from a person, I would assume that this narrative has to do with the artist already knowing something that is painfully eminent, but pondering if being blind to it makes it better. There's a beauty in each of Coda's games that has been completely ignored, and then, almost comically, Davy's answer supersedes this artistry and exclaims that you must know, and not only that, but they are the answer. Not because they understand, but because as a member of the audience, they want a game that appeals to their sensibilities. And this is where I get lost with the videos I mentioned earlier. None of them actually talk about any of Coda's games. None of them critique and analyze what Davy was doing or saying or what Coda was doing. Instead, it's focused entirely on the aspects that criticizes their actions. It's entirely focused on their self and how they are involved with the art that they experienced. Not yet taking a moment to listen to what might have been said by someone. Which ends up with a deep irony because effectively they are looking at the narrator Davy's story over what Coda was trying to express to begin with. Which is exactly the things that made Davy do the things that he did. That sort of self-centered idealism. 
I feel the irony is palpable. Death of the Author What these words mean in their origin is something that has been complicated through time. Now, the colloquialism that we recognize and its usage is abstracted and deviates from the actual message of it, almost ironically. In 1967, a French critic by the name of Roland Barthes wrote an essay titled The Death of the Author. To save you the time I know you wouldn't have spent reading a French text, I'll attempt to summarize it and give you my thoughts on it. The first claim made for Death of the Author is that you cannot know the author's intent that this is something you cannot divine from the work itself. And as far as I'm concerned, this is true. Too often people look at a piece of art, whether it's a video game, a movie, an essay, a book, a painting, a drawing, or even a YouTube video, and attempt to sign intent. What is my intent while writing this script? Is it to indoctrinate you into my way of thinking? Is it to tell people that I'm better than them for knowing things that they don't know about? Is it to make people who watch this video smarter? For maybe realizing something they haven't noticed before? Is it to provide to the content Ouroboros with one more hit for my plead for relevancy so that I can kickstart a content creation career? Is this some backhanded way for me to insult creators who people will call my peers despite the fact that they've led successful careers in the field long before I even started? Or is it to talk about a video game I liked and my perspective on it? When I wrote this list of possible versions of your perspective on your divination of my intent, did I purposefully leave the last one there in order for you to believe that it is my true intent? Is it purposefully the only positive one in order to manipulate you into siding with me versus everything else that I said as a possibility? Before we go too much further down this rabbit hole, I'll leave this saying, this is where we get stuck in a well of irony poisoning. As the essay says, to give a text an author is to impose a limit on that text. My summation of what this means is roughly that if I were to listen to a song and I found it extremely relatable, and I would even go around saying that it was like an anthem of my life, that realizing that some other person had wrote it would impose limitations that I would have to recognize that this other person who wrote this song doesn't know me and that it actually is about their life. I feel like this limitation does matter, objectively speaking. While areas of study go into the collective unconscious and the nature of memes and assigns a tent to more than just any particular author, the fact that it had come from a single person does mean that it does in fact have intent. In my perspective, it feels important to recognize the author and attempt to empathize with them, understand who they are and what they are. When you look at a piece of artwork, it's almost impossible to not see yourself in it. And when you talk about it, you're often not talking about the art itself. Today I've talked about my experience, my interpretation on the art, and now I'll tell you what I take away from it. As pointed out earlier, people's odd impositions and refusal to talk about the game itself, what do I mean when I say I want people to actually talk about the game in these videos? Art is an expression. It's a bit more than just a conversation. It's a package of ideals intended to deliver a message or an experience or an idea. What does it mean to be a protagonist? Whenever I experience any art, this is what I look for. I want to know what the author is saying to me. Not to say I always know with 100% accuracy, but the attempt at such makes art beautiful. All art. Because for a moment you step outside of yourself, and you see what someone else sees, but you're still contained within yourself. You can't get a one-to-one -one experience, and trying to do so is fruitless. You cannot take your version of this experience and in turn impose that onto the author because you made that. All criticism fails when this attempt isn't made, and well, with my attempt in recognizing fully that this is only my interpretation based off my own lived experience, I find that the beginner's guide is about the act of being an artist, the odds you are imposed with when it comes to the reason you make things and what you want people to see them for. 
Davy and the Game, in my interpretation of such, is about how you make compromises to your art. Is a game a game if all you do is sit in a cage for hours? Think of it like this. Coda is the id, the narrator is the superego, and the artist Davy Reedon acts as the ego. Coda has something they want to express. The joy of living in a single isolated moment. The beauty of doing repetitive tasks. The sort of peace that exists there. But the narrator knows that this is not all there is. That there is, in fact, more. That this gameplay by itself is not a game when it has no point. The artistry of this would be lost on people. Because after a while, the mundanity sets in and the intent of peace becomes replaced with confusion and unease, and then shortly, frustration. This dynamic and the way I perceive the game would paint the creator and the game as a collection of ideas and expressions that the creator set aside because the idea of the audience imposing what good game design is and how that affects the will to create in the first place. So by illustrating this as done so in the beginner's guide, with this part of himself becoming not only itself, but also the video essayist, who really cares more about themselves than the art? I don't know. To me, this feels like a copacetic narrative. One that recognizes each of its constituent parts and takes meaning from it. It doesn't matter if this is what Davy Reedon intended. Not because his intent doesn't matter. Because without asking him, I cannot know that this is what it meant. This is only what I find effective for me, and I hope my explanation of such makes you look at art differently instead of taking my interpretation and acting as if it's your own. And I guess all I can ask is, Davy, how off the mark was this?